In this video, we will explore the Interactions extension introduced in version 1.2.9 of Elements Hive Pro. The Interactions extension is an advanced feature that allows you to create bespoke animations, micro-interactions, and interactions based on your specific needs. It is an unopinionated abstraction that provides you with building blocks for custom interactions using a trigger, action, and target workflow. A trigger defines when an interaction is initiated, an action defines what will happen once the interaction is triggered, and the target defines where the action will be applied. In the launch version, the following triggers, actions, and targets are available. For the latest list, you can visit the corresponding documentation page on the Elements Hive website. There are also demo sections available in the design library that you can add to your websites and learn from. The Interactions extension is enabled on all elements and can be accessed via the Settings tab under the Elements Hive Pro category. And you can add as many interactions as needed per element. The first option we have is the Trigger category, where we can choose between element triggers such as click or page triggers such as page load. Under the element triggers, we can use native browser events such as click, pointer enter, and pointer leave. We also have triggers that are only relevant if a certain extension or feature is used on the chosen element, like the element's hive entrance animation triggers, or for certain types of elements like in the case of the Lottie animation triggers. In the action setting, we can choose from DOM operations such as set, remove, and toggle, a CSS class, or a data attribute. Set a CSS variable or custom property. Control an element's hive entrance animation. A Lottie animation element. Or a media element like a video or audio. In the delay setting, we can define an optional delay if needed. Under the target setting, we have the options between the current element, the parent element, or any element that can be targeted using a valid CSS selector. Now that we've seen the available options, let us create a few basic examples to get comfortable with this new, powerful feature. The first example will be a common read more Carter block. It's pretty easy to implement and is perfect to show how you use the breakdance selector feature in combination with the interactions extension to change the state of elements based on the chosen trigger. In this case, we want to hide a portion of the text in the card until the user clicks the Read More button. We will start by giving our text element a CSS class that we will use in our interaction. We will then edit the new class and define the default state of our element. In this case, we will use the Max Height property to transition the card from the partially hidden to the fully revealed states. We will add a max height of 110 pixels, add an overflow hidden, and define a transition to smooth out the animation. Next, we will create a new CSS class called Expand that will define our expanded state. In the Expand CSS class, we will add a max height of 450 pixels. Based on the amount of text content in the example, this should be enough. If we test this by adding the Expand class to the text element, we can see the card expanding to reveal the hidden text, and this is essentially what we want to do with our interaction. With the button element chosen, we will open the Interactions modal from the Settings tab. We will create a new interaction with a click trigger. Under Action, we will use Toggle Attribute. The attribute type will be Class. 
the class name will be the expand class that we created, and the target will be the CSS class we first assigned to our text element. The result is that this interaction will either add the expand class if it doesn't already exist, or remove it if it does exist on the text element every time the button is clicked. Interactions are not visible inside the builder, so let's see what it looks like on the front end. Great, it works as expected. There is, however, a problem with this implementation if you have other similar elements. Let's duplicate our card element a couple of times to visualize the issue. As you can see, since all our text elements share the same CSS class, they all respond to the interaction of every card. We need a way to make the interactions self-contained within each card. And we have several ways we can accomplish this. If we only have a couple of cards, we could opt to add a separate CSS class to each text element and update the interactions accordingly. But this won't be feasible if we have lots of cards or if this was a global block used in a repeater field or a post loop. Remember that the target can be any valid CSS selector. Given the simple card structure, and since we already have a selector with our expanded state defined, one simple option is to change the order of the elements so that we can reference the text element using the CSS sibling selector. Visually, however, we want the elements to remain in the same original order. And for that, we can apply a flex direction of column reverse. Now, we can reference the text element from within the interaction of the button element using the CSS sibling selector. In the interaction, we will update the CSS selector to use the special selector keyword from Breakdance to reference the current element and the tilde character to reference a sibling. We will see other ways we can change the state of child elements in later examples. Now let's test on the front end to make sure it is still working. Looks okay. So now we can duplicate the card again and see if the interactions are self-contained as expected. Now each button only expands its parent card. And of course, if this was a post loop or grid element, then your columns would expand as needed when one card is open, and given the same vertical alignment, the text of the closed cards would be aligned as you'd expect. In the next example, we want to create a list of video tiles for our project page. And since we will have several videos, we only want the video to play when we hover over it. On the video element, we will enable the loop option. Next, we will add our interactions to enable the video playback on hover. In the interactions modal, we will add an interaction with a trigger of pointer enter, an action of media, a media action of play, and set the target to self. Then we can duplicate the interaction, change the trigger to pointer leave, and the media action to pause, so that on subsequent hovers, we can continue watching the video from where we left off. If we preview the page and hover over the video, the video starts playing and pauses when the cursor leaves the video element. Let's add some text to our tile to represent additional details about each project. On the text element, we will add a class and then define our initial state in the selector. The text element should animate using a fade-in down transition when we hover over the video. For the default state, we will give it an opacity of 0, add a translate transform on the y-axis of minus 40 pixels, and define a transition to smooth out the animation. We have already seen how we can reference a sibling element directly in an interaction in the previous example. This time, we will make use of custom data attributes instead. Let's add a CSS class to our card wrapper. This will be used in a selector that we will create shortly. Under the video element, we will add a new interaction with a trigger of pointer enter, an action of set attribute, an attribute type of data attribute, a name of data active, a value of true, and a target of parent, which in this case is the card wrapper. 
And just like we did before, we duplicate the interaction and reverse the action on pointer leave. In the selector panel, we will add a new selector to represent our active state. For the selector, we will use the CSS class we added to our card element and the data attribute that is toggled by the interactions on the video element and the CSS class we gave to our hidden text element. Once added, we edit our new selector and define our active state. In this case, we want an opacity of 1 and translate transform on the y-axis of 0. Let's test it on the front end and see if everything is working as expected. Hmm, the video is playing but the text is not visible. Let's double check the new interactions we added to see what we did wrong. The problem is we didn't change the trigger on the last interaction to pointer leave. Keep in mind that interactions are processed from top to bottom and the last one wins in case of competing instructions. Now when we hover over the video, the video starts playing. The additional text fades in from the top and when the cursor leaves the video, the video pauses and the text fades out. We can, of course, add as many tiles as we need, or turn the tile into a global block and use it with a repeater element or post loop with dynamic data, and it will work without any modifications necessary since the interactions are self-contained. You should now have a better understanding of one of the main workflows that you will be using. Selectors are used to define the states of elements using the selector manager, and the interactions are used to orchestrate changing those states. Let's create another example. This time, we want to create a hotspot image, but unlike the traditional tooltip-like pattern that we can just create with the standard tooltip element, we want our hotspot information to be visible in a separate container on the right of or below the image depending on the size of the viewport. On the left column, we will add an image of the Breakdance UI. Next, we'll add an icon to represent our first hotspot and style the icon the way we want. Next, we will position the icon where we need it to be with position absolute, using relative units so that the positioning is responsive. Hotspot images usually have a pulsating effect on the hotspots to attract the user's attention. For this, we can just copy-paste any CSS pulsating effect freely available and use it in our selector. On the icon element, we will add a new CSS class and edit it. And in the selector panel, we will add the custom CSS for our pulsating effect. This way, all our hotspots with the same class will have the effect applied. We want to give some visual feedback to the user on hover, so we will add a new selector for the hover state and disable the pulsating effect animation. The next thing we need is the information we want to show when the hotspot is clicked. In this case, we just want a heading and a text element. On the wrapper, we will add a couple of classes. One will be common among all the panels we have, and another to identify each panel separately. We will edit the common class and assign a position absolute, an opacity of zero, and define a transition to smooth out the animation. Next, we will create our interactions on the hotspot icon. First, we want to make sure that we hide any open panel. For this, we create an interaction with a trigger of click, an action of remove attribute, an attribute type of class, a value of our active class, 
and a target with our panel class that is common to all panels. Then we duplicate the interaction, change the action to set attribute, and the target CSS selector to the element panel class. The only thing missing now is the active class we used in the interaction, which defines the active state for the info panels. We will create a new selector using that class name and define an opacity of 1. Now let's test on the front end what we have so far. Seems right. The hotspot has that pulsating effect, and when we click it, the info panel on the right is shown. Let's add a couple of things to make it nicer. First, on the icon hover selector, we want to add a pointer cursor. Next, for the panel animation, let us add a blur filter into the mix to make it more interesting. In our active state, we want a blur of 0, and in our default state, we will add a blur of 20 pixels. If we test it on the front end, we can see that our info panel is animated using a slight blur as expected. The basic building blocks are finished. Let's see what it takes to create another hotspot location and corresponding panel now. We can just duplicate the icon, maybe add some descriptive labels on the structure panel, adjust the position as needed. Duplicate the panel and add the new content. On the new icon, update the last interaction to use the new panel's corresponding class. And update the class list on the new panel. Now we can alternate the info panels of the hotspots that we have using our custom interaction. Given that this is a beginner walkthrough video, we just scratched the surface of what is possible with this powerful feature in the three examples we built. Nevertheless, you should now have a deeper understanding of some of the ways you can use the interactions extension and be able to start creating and experimenting on your own. In the design library, you will find several examples available as demo sections that you can add to your page and use as is or study how it's built to build your own versions. And when you add a demo section, any selectors it uses are also copied over. There is also a selectors import and export tool available in the WordPress dashboard to help you migrate selectors between websites. The interactions extension is still evolving and may already have more options than what is covered in this video. Make sure to join the Elements Hive Facebook community group to have the latest information on Elements Hive.